Um, thank you all for coming. So my name is Amanda Webster. I'm with the University of Wollongong in Australia. And um, I'm going to be talking today about some work I've been doing with adult women on the spectrum. And the study is really about looking at successful women and what helped them to be successful. And I've done this study a little bit with a colleague of mine, Dr. Suzanne Garvis, who's with the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Let me tell you a little bit about this study. So um, I got interested in this study in, in several ways. And um, I work very much in spaces of creating environments and creating attitudes and understandings in schools and communities. And so, because I work with children and um, families a lot, one of the things, of course, that comes to me all the time is about problems and issues. And um, in looking at all the research on adults and outcomes, one of the things that I noted all the time was, A, there's not a lot of research on adults, although that is changing, but there's even less on, of course, adult women. We know very little about the experiences of adult women. The research, however, that's out there is what I call the gloom and doom picture. And if you read a lot of the research on adults on the spectrum, and particularly um, most of the research has very little women, it's about, you know, as we know, four to one men, and that's pretty much represented in the research itself. But it presents a lot of the stories of the poor outcomes, poor employment, poor um, quality of life, et cetera. And although I don't want to detract from that research, because it is very important, I wasn't sure that was telling me what I needed to know to be able to help these young girls and women as they were coming up and to be able to help their families. So um, there's some research a long time ago, I remember when I was going through, um, I think my undergraduate master's degree, that really was looking at children and students in schools that succeeded, that came from very difficult homes, um, families with a lot of um, broken relationships, drugs, inner city stuff, and that succeeded inside of the challenges. And that they found it was more useful to look at people that did well in spite of those challenges rather than the people who were limited by those challenges. So I thought, well, why don't I apply the same thing here? And the other thing that I think there was two other things that influenced me. Three years ago was the Autism Europe Conference, and I heard Dr. Peter Vermeulen, I have a terrible time with this name and I apologize if he's here, but um, some of you heard him yesterday and he was talking about happiness. And I thought, and he was talking about rather than looking at quality of life, why aren't we measuring happiness? And I thought, wow, that's really neat. Why aren't we looking about what really success is and what do people think means to be successful? And the other thing that, I, uh, that really influenced my thinking in this study was I was watching the movie about Temple Grandin's life. How many of you have seen that? Ah, uh, most of you, yeah. Fabulous movie, fantastic. But I'm watching that, and one of the things that I was thinking as I was watching this movie was, you know, here's a woman that has been a, a trailblazer for many people out there, came through um, the system before, you know, there was really a, a formal diagnosis, even a separate diagnosis of autism, has succeeded um, far beyond what anybody expected when she was very young. And um, watching that movie, I thought there was some really little hints about why maybe she succeeded. First of all, as you watch that movie, you see the fantastic drive and the intelligence and the, the, the inner quality she has which of course, anybody that's ever heard Temple speak or read her books, that comes across very strongly. But the other thing that really impressed me was how much there were significant people in her life that if they hadn't been there and hadn't helped her make critical decisions in her life, she wouldn't have been able to succeed either. So I started thinking about why don't we look at the lives of adult women who see themselves as successful to find out why is it they think they're successful, and more important, what helped them to get there? Because if we can find that out, maybe we can put that in place for other people. And that's more interesting to me, I guess, than looking at all the problems, although we need to do that. So um, obviously, as I said, a lot of that research focusing on those poor outcomes, but we do know that some individuals succeed despite that despite those challenges. We also know that quality of life may not be, um, indicators may not be really encapsulating what success really means. And also, we know that women may have different perspectives than men. And men, much of the research, you know, if you look at the research on adults, I think only one study I could found even looked at women and their experiences, most of them looked at women and men, they didn't single out the women. And we do know that adult women look at success and the things that have shaped them as women different than men. 
So um, I wanted to go out there and I wanted to talk to women. And I wanted to find out women who felt they were successful and see what it is they had to say about the things that helped them to get where they were, why they felt they were successful, and how they overcome barriers along their way. So we recruited 10 people in Australia. Um, one of the women I did talk to uh, does currently live in America. She is Australian. And um, all of them, I, interesting enough, had been diagnosed with um, Asperger's syndrome as adults. Not one woman I talked to had been diagnosed as a child. Now, I think this was obviously for a couple of factors, not the least of which was we purposely recruited people over the age of 25. And the reason for that is, you know, as you're growing up, I don't think most people would feel they've, you know, you're still developing. Really, we wanted to get them a chance to have gone through that development stage and actually sort of be more into their adult self and have a chance to get past their studies or get into a job and those kind of things. So because of that, obviously, a lot of the women we talked to were actually older when a um, diagnosis of Asperger's was included in the DSM-4. So when many of them were young, there was not a diagnosis that was as representing um, people across the spectrum. It was more looking at that classic autism. Um, um, there was other factors as well, certainly the fact that uh, um, they were women. Interesting enough, we're now starting to look at men in a similar study, and so far, and we're looking at the same age range, the men much more have been diagnosed as, as youngsters. So obviously, I'm guessing that the fact that they were girls probably was another reason besides their age that they were not diagnosed, okay? Um, so we didn't find success. I put out a thing and I said, if you think you're successful, come talk to me, basically. Because I didn't think it was up to me to define what success is. And I wanted to know why do they feel they're successful? What makes them feel that way? And um, I advertised for university website and um, as I said, we got them to sign success. So of the 10 participants that we talked to, and we talked to them quite a bit in detail in different interviews, um, all of them, there was a variety of jobs. Now, one of the things that was really interesting to me was how much they talked about, a lot of them talked about how they had created their own jobs. They'd actually had problems in the traditional employment sector um, for a variety of reasons, and a lot of them had actually carved out their own jobs. Um, they had a variety of education backgrounds. Um, some, one had, uh, two had gone on to a PhD. I will say that one of the others, while I was talking to her, said she wanted to go back and study. She's actually doing a PhD now. Um, so, you know, they, they were overall a fairly educated group. Um, they were across Australia. They weren't in one location. Um, about half were in a relationship or, or married, um, and the other half were single. Almost every one of them, though, talked about very difficult relationships they'd been in. Several were divorced, and several had had very significant um, relationships broken up. So that was really challenging. Five of them did have children. They were mothers. And of those, most of those individuals were diagnosed after their child was. And their identity as a mother came out as really important. So that's one thing, again, I'm interested to see when I talk to the men how it's different. So certainly their experience as mothers, partners, wives was also a significant factor they talked about. Different types of professions, um, health and fitness, university lectures, we had a couple of those, uh, hospital administrators, government workers, counselors. Um, and we had one lady that um, she, for... Um, anxiety and other reasons was currently receiving disability, but what she was doing was she had actually carved out a real um, place for herself as a fundraiser, and she was doing, when she was up to it, she was taking these walks literally across Australia. Now, um, that's kind of like walking across Europe into Russia, you know? It's, Australia is big and empty. We have a lot of desert with no nothing except camels. So um, she was walking, and kangaroos. So she was walking, she would go and do these tremendous fundraisers where she'd walk across Australia. And I said, don't you get lonely? She says, no, no, it's great. And she had this little trailer she'd take with her and she'd travel. But she'd raise thousands and thousands of dollars for different charities. So she wasn't traditionally employed, but she was definitely had a vocation which she thought she was very successful in. So in talking to these women, one of the things that came across that struck and really was a big theme that came out was how much they talked about critical moments that shaped their lives, and which is why I've 
titled this talk about critical moments. And, and the three critical things they really talked about were, first of all, their diagnosis. Now, they all talked about their um, issues with diagnosis and particularly how that shaped their identity, and I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. They talked about at some point in their life, they've all, they had all faced, this was, this was something that really surprised me, they'd all faced some sort of pivotal crisis um, an abusive spouse, um, a meltdown in school, a problem with a family member, a, a, a legal issue. And they had all made a decision, a conscious decision at that time, to take charge of their life and take it in a new direction. And that, to me, was the essence of why they felt they were successful. And I'll talk more about that again. They also talked about traumatic events. And I'm telling you, they had traumatic events. I don't know if it was the luck of the draw or what, but I, um, my I paid somebody to transcribe these interviews, and usually transcriptions were very cold, but even she wrote back, she says, oh my gosh, I needed to drink a wine after I read all those. Because these, I mean, several of the, they had traumatic issues in their lives. So as I said, what came across so strongly, why they felt they were successful, and what I thought really categorized their success was they saw themselves as agents of change. They saw that they could take charge of their life and take it in a different direction. And to me, this was a powerful message. They, they all demonstrated self-efficacy, and we actually ended up later applying self-efficacy theory, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. They all felt that they had an ability to act and do things. They didn't see themselves as victims. And I mean, when things happen in their life, like bullying or abuse or bad things in jobs or they got fired, they never, one, uh, they, they talked about they got a little blue or whatever, but what I thought categorized this group of individuals and probably why they had achieved what they had was they didn't sit there and say, oh, poor me. They said, nope, I'm going to do something about it. And I thought that was a key message as well. They demonstrated high agency. They were able to make critical decisions at pivotal moments in their life. And as far as resilience and change and teaching people and children, I thought, again, this was a key message. And they also felt that verbal communication and having somebody in their life that believed in them and propelled them to change directions at the right point was also critical. So there were some external factors. So first, diagnosis. As I said, they were all diagnosed as adults. And all of them told a similar story. And again, this one surprised me a little bit. Um, I went into this study with really, hopefully not a lot of preconceived notions. I had a few, but they were probably more about, there probably been some things in their, li their, their self and in their lives that had helped. But one of the things that really surprised me was how similar their diagnosis stories were. And what they all talked about was getting diagnosed. Now, a lot of them said they got diagnosed because either somebody in, uh, because um, somebody in their family saw something about autism and said, oh, that sounds like you all those problems you've been having and they went yeah or their child got diagnosed and they self-reflected or they read something but after they got diagnosed this they as all said they went through this period of about two to four months of questioning and what I call the blue funk period and they sort of said they all got a little down for a little bit while they sort of evaluated what does this mean does this mean you know sort of looking at what does it say about me does this mean I'm less than, or what does this really say? But through that period of time, they all talked about doing reading and talking to other people, and particularly learning about other um, individuals and particularly women on the spectrum, and how after that period of two, four, four, they all, I mean, across the board, all 10, said they came out with a new sense of identity and self-efficacy. They, they gained a whole sense of self-esteem. They said, this makes sense. I'm gonna make this work for me. And they really felt this empowered them after they went through that period of sort of readjustment. They also said it gave them insight into their strengths and limitations. They said this gave me a whole new understanding of myself and an understanding of how to go out and advocate for what I need and how to get things for myself. It gave them explanations and relief and certainly we've heard that at other times. And it opened doors. Ironically, they said, you know, it, it, it opened up, and it was, as this one lady said, it also opened up doors for me to understand how I fit into society and allowing me to be who I am. I can be true to myself. I don't have to try to be someone else anymore. I don't have to try to fit in. So what they said was it, it kind of validated that they could 
they could quit trying to be something, and there wasn't anything wrong, and this was what they could be. So as I said, they all talked about this period of readjustment and then this improved sense of themselves. Now, they also talked about these pivotal crises. And um, they had these pivotal moments when they were faced with a crisis and they make this action. So some of them were faced with a crisis where they decided to go, nope, I'm going to go get a new qualification. I'm going to go new study. Now, a significant proportion, and I can't remember, but I think it was four or five of them. Right? It was over 30 um, percent had, really, had dropped out of school in high school and primary school. But they, they were able to get a, a qual um entrance through TAFE or something like that into university, and they went and they undertook degrees. And some of them didn't talk about gutting it out. They also, many of them talked about changing careers. They said, you know what? It wasn't working. It wasn't going fast, so I took a new direction. I started my own company. I became this. I changed in this way. One lady had been a, um, a nun for a little bit, and actually in England, and was really struggling and said, no, nope, this is not for me. I'm leaving, I'm doing something totally different. She went back, got qualifications, and now she's specializing as a counselor for other women with a, on, on the spectrum. Um, some women made a conscious decision to lead a problematic partner or husband, and they talked about that. And others left home. So some of the women had problematic relationships with their parents and family. They said, nope, I'm not doing this anymore. But what was really true of all of them was they said, you know what, this isn't working. I don't have to do this anymore. I'm going to do something different and make my, myself happier. And again, isn't that a powerful message? So as this lady said, and then I left. I was very proud of that. I met him at uni, and I was living with him. I had my son, and I opened up another bank account, and I saved the money, and I took my kids and got out of there, which is something my mother never did. So I was very proud of myself. That was a real turning point. So again, to me, this was a powerful message because these are significant changes that I think a lot of adults struggle with. So for these women to really do that, you know, is really empowering, I think. They also, as I said, did talk about these traumatic events. Um, of the women I talked with, I talked to 10 women. Three had been raped. Others had been sexually abused. Several had been physically abused by family or other people. Um, one had attempted suicide. One had spent time in jail um, because of some drug issues. Several talked about real issues with parental conflict. And I'm not talking about arguments. I'm talking those were also abusive. I mean, really problematic and legal trouble. So these women, by and large, had some significant stories. These were not women who had not experienced troubles in their life. So I think, again, this is what they, what they had been able to do, though, was not let those events define them, but move on and rise above them. So we started looking at, um, once we sort of got through this sort of key themes, we started thinking and looking, and, just, and really, these stories really reflected a lot of self-efficacy theory. And we really thought that looking at self-efficacy theory and what it had to tell us about this was a, um, a really good lens. And because what we really saw was that their stories were categorized by these critical moments in their lives in which they made a choice and took action, and by doing that, they developed self-efficacy to make those critical decisions in the future, and it made them feel successful. So self-efficacy in self-efficacy theory, Alberta Bandura talks about that self-efficacy is defined as ability in your belief to succeed. Well, certainly, these women felt they could succeed, and they'd had experiences that showed them that they could, and they developed that confidence and that self-esteem. They believed that they could organize and execute actions to achieve goals. That came across over and over. If I have a goal, I'm going to set it out. I'm going to do it no matter what. They believed they could play a role in um, um, their confidence, played a role in their future goals and tasks. And they also viewed difficult situations as things to um, think about and, and deal with rather than to be avoided. So I thought that was, again, looking at this was really true. Now, Brandura talks about there's four self sources of self-efficacy, and we certainly saw this in these women's stories. One is mastery experience, and this is where you gain competency from things you've done. And certainly these women, um, as I said, because they would made these critical decisions in their life, it proved to them they could do these things, and they gained the self-efficacy for future challenges. They also learn through modeling or vicarious experience. Now, this is when you learn by watching others or learning about others. Now, most of the women didn't talk about learning directly from other women, 
um, other than sometimes in spite of like the one lady saying that she did something her mom never did. But what they did all talk about was reading and looking at videos of other women. And again, that, that was particularly critical in that period of time when they were doing that readjustment following diagnosis. So again, that vicarious experience, learning about other women, really key. They also, um, another factor in self-efficacy is social persuasion, being persuaded by others. And they all talked about different people who had helped them to believe in themselves. And physiological factors, and those are the type of things, those inner qualities. So the mastery experience to me was the greatest impact on their self-efficacy. They mastered in university studies. They mastered these horrible challenges. There was one lady, and, and I thought this was a great story, and she was, a, um, she was an entertainer, and she was a singer. And, uh, and she would do um, impersonations of famous singers. And she told me all about this. And I said, well, you know, how has that gone? And she says, well, you know, it's been challenging. There's a lot of noise and lights. I was like, yeah. And um, <laughs> I said, how are you dealing with that? She says, well, I got up there and it was really bothering me, all that noise. So I designed some special headphones I could wear while I was singing, but wouldn't block out the other things. And then I designed this. And so, so again, she went into something that most people would think would be very challenging for something, some, somebody like herself who had some sensory issues. But she found ways to deal with it. Um, and uh, we also had people, as I said, they created new pathways in their work. They created new avenues. They created new companies. They be, a lot of the women were writers. They talked a lot about writing, and they liked to do that. Um, a lot of the women, the ones that were mothers, a lot of their success was their mastery and experience as a mother. And they really took pride, and they, a lot of them talked about how much that defined how they felt about themselves and the things, not only they had learned about themselves, but also now how they were looking. And many of these women had children on the spectrum, and how they were helping their children in different situations. Um, they, you know, overcoming past failures, they had all talked about that, and creating and helping others. They really wanted to move into the, the avenue of helping others. Some already had, and others, this, they were really keen to do that. Vicarious experience was probably the least impact, but as I said, the biggest factor in that was reading about other people and looking at YouTube videos. And what I thought was interesting when I was going into this study is, despite the fact that men are diagnosed on the average of four times more than women. Anybody that's ever looked at YouTube videos or personal accounts in writing, you ever noticed how many more women? So it's the women that seem to be speaking out. I don't know if that's just women talk more, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, or just more comfortable talking. But I thought that was interesting, but certainly they, they said that really helped them. They'd also um, said it was important to reconfigure models post-diagnosis that helped them. And as the lady says, I think prior to my diagnosis, I probably would have said no compared to the general population. But now knowing I'm on the spectrum, I think that kind of gives me a different perspective on all the things I've achieved. I think I am successful in terms of how people on the spectrum seem to be, maintaining relationships and jobs. So what she said was, you know, before I measured myself on traditional measures and I didn't feel successful. But now I'm looking at myself in a whole new way. So yeah, I am. So again, she said it gave her that power. They also talked about some role models, and particularly um, moms and dads. So it was a really interesting dichotomy of the women I talked to. They either talked about really problematic relationships with their parents or really close relationships. There wasn't a lot in between, but some of them definitely, their, mo their mothers in particular, were real significant role models for them. And as this lady says, yeah, well, my mom is probably the biggest influence in my life by a long shot in terms of positive role model and mentor. I really value my mom. So those were critical as well. Social persuasion was the other factor probably that was the most significant behind the mastery of experience, and it was really those people in their lives that believed in them. Um, university professors were key. Um, not too many people talked about teachers in school, which was very sad. Um, now, we have a problem in Australia. I don't know what it's like a lot of you're in, in high schools, but in our high schools in Australia, a teacher may only see their student three times a week. So one of the issues is about developing those relationships in high school. Primary school is a little different, but 
um, as they go through high school, a lot of those, the, the, the ladies did talk about real problems. Um, bosses, some of the women said, you know, once I got my diagnosis and I went to my boss and explained it, he was great, how can I help you? And a couple of the women talked about the boss and them working out little cues and, and the boss would say, no, you can do this, I want you to go in this new thing, I'll cue you, I'll help you, to, you know, and they worked out some little signals between them and they felt they had to achieve more because the boss believed they could. Partners. And they said, you know, sometimes the, uh, the husband or the partner would sit there and, and they'd be confused about something on TV, some hidden, you know, some subtle thing. They didn't get the partner. Said, oh, no, let me explain to you what's, oh, okay. So, you know, they felt that diagnosis. Of, and also people like friends. One lady ha was really active in bike riding. She talked a lot about a coach she'd hooked up with. So there were significant people. There was also a few people that were significant for the negative impact. And, and it was almost in these women's cases, rather than making closing a barrier and pulling them down it actually propelled them to achieve in spite of them, basically. They said, no, no, I've achieved because I wanted to show them. <laughs> you know, I'm going to show that husband. I'm going to leave him, and I'm going to show him I can do better without him, you know. So that was important, and they talked about family. The last one was those physiological factors, those internal things. Now, they all talked about feeling competent and feeling happy. So they associated that feeling that I can do something with their own internal happiness. And they also, almost to the person, talked about being determined and goal-oriented. So to me, this was the internal quality that really came through. And as this woman said, ability to focus intensively on a topic. Once I get organized enough and get over the anxiety of doing it to do it, also once I do decide to achieve a goal, there has been nothing that stopped me. I have achieved every single goal I've set with the exception of my latest, and I'm working on that. So the, the achieving of the goal and being determined it was a good thing, and they certainly felt it really had helped them. And they t one lady talked about putting her head down, and I just got this picture of this lady putting her head down, I'm going to do it. There was a negative side, though, and a couple of them, particularly with the university study, said they would just put their head down, and they wouldn't ask for help, and they, would, they, um, they burned themselves out. And one lady had had a person that caught her before it was too late and helped her, and really that was one of those university professors, but the other lady ended up dropping out a little bit, and then she did come back and succeed, but you know, that, that goal focus did have its downside as well. Um, negative feelings were later challenged and action was implemented. So again, the, again that ability to look at, this hasn't gone right, what else can I do was really important. Success was self-defined often as a result of their actions. Um, so as this lady says, so I try to look at things in a much broader way in terms of the things that have influenced me or hurt me, and then I can let that go, and hopefully come away from it feeling larger in spirit rather than smaller. You know, it's like it opens me up. It keeps breaking me open. So even the bad things that have happened, good has come out of them because of the way that I've been able to change and adopt. What a powerful statement. Wouldn't you love to give that to every girl going through school? So, other factors they talked about, certainly they all had a positive sense of themselves. One of the first things I asked them to do is, how do you describe yourself? And they all talked about good things. They were also honest about a few things. You know, I'm bullheaded, I'm stubborn. I'm not the nicest to be around with relationships sometimes. You know, they were. They talked about their relationships with partners and other people. Now, as I said, almost all the women, I, I think to the person, all the women talked about re romantic relationships that had gone very badly. I think one woman or two were on the third marriage, something like that. A couple of the women did say that they'd kind of given it up, and that was an area they just weren't worried about anymore. They were doing other things. They were more comfortable in themselves. So that was continuing to be a challenge. And they did talk about school and work relationships. So again, just positive sense of self. And this lady said, the Asperger's is part of me. It's actually, I would not have had it. Um, I would have had it. It's part of my character. It's part of who I am. The Asperger's is not really a disability. It's just a different way of viewing the world. So again, they thought those inner selves helped them to achieve despite anything, and that diagnosis was so significant. The relationship, family was significant in their life. They all talked about family. Interesting enough, I've done four interviews with men so far. Family's not talked about near as much so far. <laughs> Only talked to four, so I'm waiting to see what happens when I talk to more. The um, friends, they did not talk about friends as much. This was often a source of frustration. Um, some of them talked about either they never had a friend in high school or they found the weird group, the oddball group, you know, the strange group, and sometimes they found relationships. Some said, I'm really not very good at relationships and friendships. I feel I'm successful in other ways. That's not an area I'm very good at. Um, 
they, uh, but children, on the other hand, was a source of achievement and pride, and supervisors often helped them to believe in themselves. And uh, another lady said, he saw something in my writing that nobody had recognized or saw in me, and he gave me a 19 out of 20, and he wrote on my paper, you're a star, and that was something for me to hang on to that was positive. That I could do. And she was talking about a university professor that really made a difference for her. Another lady says, I'm surprised, uh, I think this was a boss, um, I, I'm surprised he took it really seriously. He read the sections and agreed I had problems in those areas, and that to begin with, we would choose three things to work on. Oh, this was a self-evaluation she did at work. Interrupting was one. I can't remember the other two. He would train me about how to behave in the meetings because that bothered him the most, and it was something I could take away. We went to lots of meetings together, and I would write down the different perspectives, and I wouldn't say anything until I got a nonverbal signal. So I knew all the details of the topic, and he knew the big picture, and we became a brilliant team. And I think that was really good. So, you know, that honest dialogue with that boss who believed in her, he said, yep, that's something we need to work on. How can we do it? So she was honest about her own growth and journey and learning. School and worth were often a source of accomplishment and anxiety. They did talk about bullying in school a lot. As I said, school was not a real happy place for them. Now, admittedly, I was talking to adults, so most of them really were reflecting on high school and not primary school. And that's a real challenge, and it's something I deal with on a daily basis. Many found achievement in tertiary studies. So they, they had not very successful high schools, but they were able to go on and find their own path in university, and several left school early. And I think, you know, we do know that in Australia, we have a tremendous amount of children and youngsters either leaving themselves or their parents pulling them out because they feel it's not meeting their needs. And many of those individuals are not getting back in the system. These ladies were able to do that, but um, not everybody is. Work was a source of achievement. This is one of the main ways they designed stuff that's successful as well. And they, a lot of them talked about really having those challenges, you know, with those hidden curriculum, being on time, working with others, all those kind of things. But they said, you know what? I just figured out how to make a work that worked for me. I created my own pathway, my own job. So of the eight, w 10 women, I think only two were, well, the, were really employed in traditional jobs. Most of them were in things where they could work very much on their own or they were self-employed. Um, they also felt that work colleagues that believed in them and that they connected with and the relationships were really important. Last I asked them, what's your message for other girls and young women with ASD? What would you like to say? And they all had a lot to say. First, get diagnosed early. They thought that was really important. That diagnosis was really critical. Um, better awareness, many women are carrying burdens they shouldn't be. And as I said, these women, <laughs> you know, this was a qualitative study, so I'm not going to try to generalize, but if these women's stories were like a lot of others, um, I think I might have been a basket case if I'd listened to much more. Um, keep high expectations, but be aware of, ex of limitations. So, you know, they all talked about this thing about this understanding. There's a lot of things we're really challenged with, but that's okay because there's a lot of things we can succeed. Don't worry about conforming to society's expectations. Go with your strengths. Be true to yourself. Pat yourself on the back and be thankful for what you've got. You can achieve what you want. Don't blame your diagnosis. I thought that was interesting. Aspies are ordinary. You don't have to be special. And I thought that was really interesting too because, um, you know, going into this, I wanted to look at what helps average women on the spectrum, not those ones that are highlighted, aren't they fantastic, they have all these special abilities. I want to say, no, what can we find that anybody can do? Believe and achieve, net or civil for your second of options. The more effort you put in, the greater the result. Don't be afraid to make mistakes, that's what builds success. And I thought that was powerful as well, particularly with some of the young women that I work with and girls that are afraid to make mistakes, they don't want to look silly, they don't want to look dumb. So she said, nope, that's okay. And we need to imagine, reimagine roles for girls with ASD. They said, you know what? We're not living traditional roles of women. We've come up with new roles for ourselves. So in summary, they all experienced a strong sense of self-efficacy shaped by both internal factors, such as that goal, um, focus, that determination, but they also were shaped by many external factors in their life, starting with their diagnosis, going on to the people that believed with them, but more important, the exchange between the way they saw themselves and the way they dealt with things when they came up, the way that they saw that they were as much a part of that change as other people, and how, okay, I can't do it, so I'm going to find something new. Don't sit there and wallow in it. It was really important. 
Pivotal moments led to decisive actions, which enabled them to see themselves as age of change. So my recommendations, and which is what I wanted to go into this with, for other how we can work and help young girls and other young women with a, on the spectrum. We need to focus on creating experiences. You know, we can't wrap them up in cotton wool. Those of us working in schools, you know, it's not about protecting them. Or parents, I'm a parent too, you know, when we protect children. But, you know, what they said was we need the challenges. And when there's some sort of feeling that we can deal with it, we get more success out of that. They also were instrumental in creating their own solutions. So getting the girls involved in creating their own solutions, developing their self-awareness and ability to evaluate their own skills and come up with their own solutions is really important. Need to help girls forge key relationships at key points in their lives, particularly as they're going through school with other girls, boys, but more important with those adults in their life, those people that are in the position to believe in them and get them to believe in themselves. And for me, when I work in schools a lot, that secondary area is really um, a critical uh, point in their life that I think we're losing a lot of individuals on the spectrum. And last, we need to help them build those inner skills and those inner strength. We need to help them to believe in themselves and realize that they can do it, they have what it takes, and it doesn't matter who they are and what their issues are, they have the ability to achieve no matter who they are. Thank you.